Welcome to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. This is Chris Miller. I invite you to join me as I interview artists from a variety of disciplines. We'll share powerful stories and lessons learned while making their art. Good day. This is Chris Miller with the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Um, It's a beautiful day in Dallas today. I was surprised uh, when I got up this morning and went outside. It's actually kind of cool for almost June. Um, I usually go out first thing in the morning and let the dogs out. And when I went out, uh, a little black cap chickadee came down and landed on the feeder next to me. I don't know if you know what a black cap chickadee is, but they're these delightful small birds with little black heads and they have this nice high little voice. They're very small and one of my favorites. And it started me to think about exactly why this today's guest is perfect for this podcast Um, because it's a dealing with nature and we're talking about the healing effects of nature. Um, So I'm going to introduce Valerie Grimes. She is the creator of hypnotictrip.com virtual and real life experiences that blend hiking, hypnosis, and nature to inspire powerful transformations. So uh, good morning, Valerie. It is a good morning. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Good extra, to have this conversation with you. Yes, extra crispy, crisp air today, huh? Yes, surprisingly, <laughs> and delightfully. Well, you know, I went out this morning and I sat down and and I usually do that for like 10 minutes and I just, you know, and, and I'm sure you understand that because uh, of what you do. And there's not a better way to start the day. Right. Right. Well, you know, it's funny um, in my book, the spiritual artist, I actually frame what I call moments of awe. And that's an early chapter in the book. And it talks about before you start the creative process, which is, like you just said, kind of starting the day. And so I tell people that I used to go and I will sit and look out my window at nature and nature is just a great way, right? I mean. Oh, it has everything in it, everything we need. <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and it has that, there's, you can just see the system in it, right? That things are flowing and, and, and always changing, right? Right, I, I like to think about water that way. Well, um, so tell me, I think people are probably going, what? <laughs> hypnosis and right. hiking? Probably, probably. <laughs> We're still hung up on hypnotic trip, I'm sure. <laughs> so explain I, I had, this. Explain yeah, I had this. Somebody, somebody tell me that I shouldn't call it hypnotic trip because they said, oh, that sounds like psychedelics and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, in, in some parts of the country, um, you know, psychedelics microdosing is becoming popular. And I think that's a dangerous idea because, you know, being in nature can afford us the same benefits as taking a psychedelic, a trip on psychedelics. And, you know, let's, let's try that first, right? So I wasn't afraid to call it hypnotic trip. I've been a hypnotherapist for 20 years and, uh, so I've gotten kind of immune to, you know, to all those jokes or, or whatever about it. I know firsthand the benefits of being in a state of hypnosis and hiking. And so, you know, 20 years ago when I started hiking, when I also became a, a hypnotist, um, I saw the two little distinction between the two that, you know, when you're in nature, you're in a hypnotic state, you're in a trance. And so I thought to myself, you know, why not blend these things together? I created that during COVID um, to give people a a virtual experience, a virtual hypnotic trip, you know, through Zoom or through the phone. So how, I'll have to explain this. Um, So this morning when I went outside, and, and I just kind of um, ground myself in the world around me. Um, how is that like hypnosis? I mean, how, how am I putting, my, am I putting myself in a hypnotic state when I do that? You are. So if I can compare it to being in my office. So someone comes in because they want to work on anxiety. 
So they've already decided that they're going to start improving their life in some way. So they're open to it. They're relaxed when they come in. And then I guide them into um, a state of mind that allows the conscious world around us to start to go away. The details of the day start to melt away, fade away. And they're just in a state which we create together, the client and I, where their mind is more open and receptive. And so in the office, you know, it takes about five minutes, eight minutes to guide them into that state. But you automatically step into that when you step out of nature. I'm not sure why that is, but I suspect that it's because we are from the natural world. The natural world and us go together beautifully. We feel at home there. I like to tell people we are still primitive the certain aspects of ourselves are still primitive. We used to sleep outside under the stars. So I think the DNA is triggered when we step outside and we just go, ah, oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> feels so good. And definitely, definitely. Yeah, I don't have a scientific explanation for it. Well, you know, it's, uh, I've always thought, um, I talk about, for me, when I'm doing some sort of a repetitive task, um, it's when I think the clearest. You know, if I mow the lawn and, mm -hmm. and I'm just going back and forth and back and forth yeah. um, or washing dishes, you know, and I'm wondering if there's some sort of relationship of that when you're hiking. Right. I mean, are you, because you're in this mechanical motion, uh, yeah. meditative motion? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. There is the, re the, steps there's passing the trees um you know you you said back and forth and back and forth and i thought about that old adage of the clock look you know oh him just swinging the the clock or the <laughs> pendulum back and forth and back that's so funny of forth. course you would see that, right? and that was, <laughs> yeah so when you know i don't do that in my sessions but that uh, that is how they show on tv Someone being hypnotized, you know, you stare at that and you watch that go back and forth. I wonder about these tennis matches, you know, or people. <laughs> well, I'm sure I've, <laughs> I've watched baseball games and there's this there's this motion of the game, you know, as they yeah. run the plates that you you kind of do. Your mind yeah. is it, it puts you down. Here's where we're going to go, I guess. Okay. It, it puts you into uh, your subconscious, maybe uh, tapping you into your subconsciousness. So yeah, when the when the conscious mind slows down because we become engaged in something that doesn't require our thinking, it allows the subconscious activity or the subconscious activity spontaneously increases. So the conscious mind slows down, the subconscious mind speeds up, and and this has been recorded through um, you know different studies over the you know last fifty so years that show that the cognitive thinking part of your brain, the frontal lobe does slow down quite a bit in a hypnotic state and it allows. So it's, it's like the meditation when we sit there long enough, if we can sit there and seated meditation long enough, uh -huh. we can eventually quiet the mind. I have to write. I have to actually get out my journal and write down this is a really good day today's a really good day I'm, I'm i'm happy today i'm having fun today it's a peaceful day everything's always working out for me today or whatever i can't sit there and think of that in my head it has to it, it i have to put the focus on the paper and that allows the conscious mind to you know f to wander sort of just wanders off and um, so that puts me in a in a hypnotic state to do it that way so writing is, is that state of mind as well. Painting, walking, repetitive um, household chores, driving right. long distances. Those are all hypnotic states. And we all go into hypnosis every day. We just don't realize it. I, I love that. I'm, I'm probably going to mutilate this, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've heard that phrase. Um, chop wood carry water is that how is that how it goes chop wood carry water yeah or um, after laundry is ecstasy, after laundry, <laughs> ecstasy. well there is there is something about that right there you know um i think i i learned 
instead of rushing through those day-to-day -day tasks, you know, I, I, to actually uh, savor them and and let that motion, you know, uh, people, I actually had my, my son actually came up to me the other day and he was watching me wash the dishes and he goes, you actually like that, don't you? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't like it, but I've learned to uh, surrender to it, you know, and 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 be yeah. in the moment, be present. I'm delighting to it. It's delightful, yes. <laughs> it's delightful to wash dishes. But um, when we take any task like that and um, come to terms with it, you know, just be present with it. See, I, I, Valerie, I, I think you and I are probably similar. I, I grew up with a parents that I kept a to-do list and, and very type A background. And we had a list of do this, do this, do this, and right? And 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 so to learn to not rush through that to-do list. Yes, yes, very true. Um, I, I've been called a type A Zen. <laughs> so and, maybe, and so in a way, this would this this process that you do, this hypnotic trip, would probably appeal to a lot of uh, people like that. Yeah, I've taken out um, about four groups, uh, four or five groups so far since uh, February. And they show up so bravely and not really sure what it's all going to be. And I say, you know, we're just walking in nature. Just think of it that way. We're just all going to take a walk together. And they, they, at the end of it, they say, oh my God, that was so amazing. You know, I tuned in, I do a walking meditation. I, I learned this from brother Chi Singh of Dallas meditation center. Um, so he lives on, he passed away several years ago, but he lives on um, through many of us that uh, followed him. So this walking meditation, I have them just focus on their visuals. So they're taking in only what they're seeing, the colors, the shapes, the contrasts, and to just narrow down only to what visually is around them, tuning everything else out. And then I'll time it for three minutes. And then I'll say, okay, everyone, let's gather. So we stop and they share like, wow, I didn't, I, I've never noticed how the sun streams down through the trees. And, and then we move to just sounds. And then the best one is the physical body. Like for three minutes, just focus on your, how your physical body feels walking out here, you know, and it, it's so wonderful to have them all share and they all, they all have a different experience. And um, that's the best part of the hike. And, you know, it's funny because without me, they would, if they would just show up and, and do their own hike, they would probably have the same experience. But um, it sometimes takes a person like myself to, to guide them out there and to show them these things. And uh, we also do, uh, so I teach them self-hypnosis as well. And then depending on the hike and the people I'll do at the, uh, midpoint of the hike a uh, self-hypnosis or hypnosis guided visualization depending on what the group is experiencing if the, if I get the feeling that they're all having you know a really difficult time or struggling I talk to them individually as we're walking along and then so I guide them through um, processing out the old and bringing in the new ideas well wow <laughs> There's so much you said. I'm like, okay, I could talk about this. I could talk about that. Um, so first, you mentioned that you have them tune into um, certain aspects, uh, like whether that's color or shape. Do you do you think people have different strengths in that area? Like that they're they gravitate towards certain things. Yes, some people won't cut comment on the visuals. Um, some will, the ones that don't come under the visuals will say more about how their body felt. So, kin, some, are, heard. so some are more kinesthetic, some yes. are more visual and some are more uh, audio. They hear, they hear things maybe. Yes. And then I use that information when I do the, the guided imagery, I make sure that I, I, you know, state or the suggestions are stated in a way that the majority of the group will benefit from it. Oh, I love that. So I'm learning about them. Ah, <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So you're learning how they communicate. You know, um, yes. oh, what was that book that the, uh, came out many years ago um, the, about how people speak in love, the five love languages? Do you remember yes. that book? Well, yes. 
it's it's sort of like that it is yeah it's about communication and hypnosis is only suggestive therapy so if if i don't understand how they take in information those suggestions that they give them you know may not have a good chance of making an impression i know you were in advertising and i was in advertising too and we understood that you know when people are flipping through a magazine or watching tv they're in a trance and so we our next job is to appeal to an emotion that they're having or that we want them to have so we communicate that in a way that you know, will really affect the majority of the people who are watching or viewing. How interesting, you know, I never thought about that. You know, when you're flipping through a magazine, it is a kinesthetic. It, you're it's, a trance. It's a trance, right? Flip, you're flip, trance, flip, yes. flip, 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 yeah. And, and so, um, so let, let's share that with the listeners because I, I think we've talked about this before and you've said that some people, they hear that word hypnosis and immediately, I'm a control freak, I admit it. I get like, whoa, whoa, you're not gonna control me. And and I see pictures of, you know, the hypnotist bringing people up on the stage and making them quack like a duck or, and immediately I'm like, I'm afraid. Yeah. And, and the way you describe it, this is not something you should be afraid of. Right, it's, uh, you know, people say, well, I don't, I don't want you to control my mind. And I'm like, well, your mind is already controlling you. So do you like how your mind is controlling you? And, and, you know, that's probably not a very accurate way to, to say that, but we, since our birth, all of our experiences have been registered at some level in the unconscious mind as a positive or a negative experience. And the subconscious can only express what it has in it you know what's there can only be expressed so that's why you can say well I can't believe you don't like broccoli well I don't because this mother made me eat it and I don't like it how can you not like it it's so good I'm sorry I don't like it stop (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know it's our experiences that we that we can we can only express from those experiences and so if we don't like Um, I remember one of your uh, podcasts, you were talking about the critical factor that you have and and the the unconscious criticizing that happens. And Mm -hmm. and you do that in a very light way. And I, I realized I was listening to that and I realized that, you know, that's an unconscious thing that you don't have the conscious control over. And so the mind is controlling you. you. You're doing something you really did not want to do. And so hypnotherapy accesses that tendency or that part of you to realize that in the past, that was something you learned, but in the current and in the future, it's not really something that you want to continue to do. And I, I would like you to please talk about how you're really not a critical person. I don't, I don't want the listeners to think that. <laughs> maybe, maybe explain what, you know. Well, you what, know, what's interesting, well, what, what I, I want, I'd love to point out here and, and, and share once again with my listeners is to remember that our mind, I, I like this story, our mind is a tool. It's just like our body. It's a tool. It's not who we are. Eckhart Tolle talks about we are the watcher behind the tool. And so I think what Valerie's saying here is that tool can get out of control. Our mind, because it has sucked up every experience that we've ever had, good, bad, ugly, Mm -hmm. and it's in there. And so we'll often make decisions based on these subconscious baggage, baggage maybe, right? This history, these suitcases, these suitcases that we've, we've built up and my, my suitcase might be, I have to keep a to-do list. I, I'm only effective if I have a to-do list. And so I come back to it and I go, wait, is that true? You know, is it true that I need to have a, an action item list or am I motivated enough? Do I know what I want? And so when you're talking about hypnosis, you're going back to that, that mind level, right? That, that 
subconscious, did you say, or um, unconscious? It's either one. Um, mm -hmm. Subconscious is usually the one I use mostly. Um, but it's the unconscious mind, meaning that we're not conscious of it. It, so, it resides un, below our conscious awareness. And so part of it is, is being aware of watching those thoughts. You know, I, I do say that in my book also is watching myself think. When I paint, you know, I'm watching my thoughts. I started painting the stroke and I would hear my mind I would hear my mother's voice, or, you can't be an artist, you know, or artists don't make money or, or how arrogant, how selfish to be an artist. That's a message we often get, you know? Okay. And so what you're, what you do with hypnosis is help people counter that messaging. Yes. Right. So that's an association or identification, that critical voice. It sounds like it's, you learn that through, through mom and, and listening to her do that. And so in hypnotherapy, we actually can talk to the child aspect or the part of you that, that is doing that behavior. And it, this gets a little kind of complicated to explain, um, but to, to talk to that part of you with the current 2021 adult reasoning mind and bring that information back to the child aspect to say do you really want to continue using this voice um, you have the ability now to to transform it and it's it's the inner it's like creating an inner cooperation an inner conversation with the different aspects of the different voices the different parts of you and come to an agreement that, well, that was then, this is now. And it has a, a very fascinating, spontaneous response that helps people to stop doing what they were formally doing just by, by examining at that deeper level. So they are still in control. It's what? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. I've had people um, tell me, you know, in a, in a hypnotic session, even in a trance state, uh, to bug off. Um, they didn't say it that nicely. <laughs> For example, if you're trying to, to have someone do something they really don't want to do, for instance, people come in to stop drinking or to stop smoking, and I'm talking, having a conversation while they're in trance with the part of them that drinks or the part of them that smokes. And if they really don't want to stop that because they believe it is serving a positive purpose, then they'll ignore me, they won't participate, and they may, they may terminate the trance and just open their eyes and say, oh, this isn't working. But all that means is we need to, to create more conversation in that um, for, for that part of them to find the cooperation and be part of what the conscious self wants to be. And eventually they, if they stick with it, that will, that will come about. So what that means is yes, the client, the subject is very much in control because they didn't take what I was suggesting. They stopped the, the trance and, and people can do that at any time. So if I'm repeating this back wrong, let me know. But okay. so we're taking our 2021 self mm -hmm. and, and going back and listening to all those voices that were built in all those other years and we're deciding, okay, um, do I still need to keep a to-do list? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm right. giving it a very uh, right. safe place, but it could be, do I still need to drink or smoke or um, eat, eat too much food? And then we kind of go, hmm, maybe I do. I mean, we can discuss it. Or right. So you're you're able to look at the pattern and, and the reasons why and to understand them with your adult reasoning mind, because before we're 12, we don't have that critical factor. And so everything that we've experienced just goes into the subconscious without, you know, the critical factor, without analyzing it. So we just accept it as fact, especially something that comes from parents, um, something that's repeated to us over and over, 
through traumatic experiences. So the subconscious becomes fixed with ideas um, through those ways. And so coming into a hypnotic state, the adult gets to look at those old ideas and decide whether they want to keep them or not. Mm. Yeah. Can, can look, get, you get an opportunity to evaluate them. Well, let me ask you this, Valerie, because with this, this is great um, technology. So how did you get into it? Because I mean, the, the, you, you have to be a pretty brave soul, I think, to, to face your demons, so to speak. Yes. Well, you know, most people come because they've tried everything else. Um, so I was running an advertising agency in 1998 or 99. And I was drinking coffee in the morning, drinking alcohol at night, um, not dealing with the stress, just pushing, pushing, pushing through and not, you know, not even aware that I was a problem. Uh (laughs) My son was 11 and he said, um, this is when I became aware. He said, mom, you're no fun anymore. That woke me up, but I still didn't know really what to do, how to get out of this thing I had created this crazy treadmill I was on. So the rug got pulled out from under me. My three main clients were bought by one big conglomerate manufacturer. And within three months, they all disappeared. And it was 20 years since I was in that industry from when I was 18 to 38. And I was exhausted. So I was kind of glad, but then I was also angry. Um, I got a call from Ann Wilson of the Dallas Hypnosis Training Institute. She said, um, Valerie, I remember working with you a couple of years ago. It was an industrial brochure project and they did recycled glass. And she said, you're really good at making difficult things sell. I have a hypnosis school and I need you to help me uh, market that school. And I thought a hypnosis. School. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I needed the client. So I, I went and met with her and uh, she was just so professional. And I thought, wow. You know, this hypnosis is is a very professional, legitimate practice. Anyway, did the brochure and you'll you'll appreciate this. So I hand her the proof, the final proof, you know, and she looks at it and she says, oh, this is really lovely, dear. But can I make a comment? So I said, sure. And I started straightening my suit and my hair. And she goes, no, no, dear, you look lovely. <laughs> But um, it looks like you're having a hard time holding it together. Oh, oh my God. God. She saw right through me. And, you know, I was vulnerable. in suit and I had my shoulder bag, my satchel. And, you know, I thought I looked really professional, but she saw right through me. And I just started to cry in her office like a baby, like snot was like oh my <laughs> god well you know what talk I, about I did, talk she about this way of helping me to let go and then she goes why don't you come in for a couple of sessions and I'm like okay <laughs> you know I didn't know what else to do so she really helped me process through all the pain and all the stress of working you know for my dad I didn't mention that I worked for my dad for 15 years and then for five years trying to follow in his footsteps to make his company successful you know and um all while ignoring my family and myself so when she said why don't you sign up for the school she said it's like kind of the same thing hypnosis you know you're you're boiling down what people are telling you into some suggestions that's advertising you know and so I signed up for her school and I opened a practice in 2000 So, you know, Valerie, we think about the synchronicity of that, right? I think about it. You're in this construction industry and, and this, uh, this comes to you. It was a gift. It's like, it's a gift from spirit directing you onto the right path. Um, which I, I really do believe. I believe that if we listen, if we listen, spirit is talking to us all the time. And, and obviously you were willing to listen, whether it was because, because t- it, it sounded so horrible where you were, yeah. you know, uh, emotionally and, and situationally, situationally, it's not who you are. It's just the situation you were in. And suddenly look at that. I mean, it's just amazing. And it, it, it's, it's people say, Oh, it's so awful right now. I'm like, well, 
it, it needs to be, you know, so you can see it. Um, you know, people have all these problems and they just, they want their lives to be happy all the time, but it's, it's, it's in this, the sadness and the sorrow and the, that we can, I think spirit finally gets um, our attention and we're, we're willing, we're on our, we're crumbling to our knees where I was on my knees and I was very, I was listening, you know, I wanted to, to know what to do. I, I fell apart. You know, Pema wow. Shodan talk has a book, uh, when things fall apart. And, um, I read that many, many times. And what's wonderful. I don't have to read those books anymore. And who, who was that author again? Um, Pema Chodron. She was a, she's a Buddhist monk. Oh, wow. I don't, I haven't read that book. Yeah, I I'll have it. I'll give it to you. I do. I love, you know me, I love reading books. So, uh, so I think there is a value to when things, you know, if we get to that point too, and now you can see that as a gift, you know, now hopefully you can look back and say, okay, that situation with the job and with, with my father and all that was actually a gift because it got me here. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't change it. Wow. So I think they also must make you pretty empathetic to people that come in with their own issues. And Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I've experienced everything. Um, deaths, loss of businesses, loss of a parent, child, um, you know, strings of relationships that didn't work, financial difficulty, raising a child as a single mom. <laughs> yes. So, so there's just a couple of things that I haven't experienced. And I used to think, you know, why am I having such a hard time? But it's, it's to help keep me humble and honest. And um, I'm always striving to, to uh, move up and out, you know? Um, you know, I talked to this, uh, weaver several episodes back an hsp weaver and she used the term dark night of the soul i had never heard that before <laughs> and i it sounds to me that that's what you experienced it's a dark night and she said it's an incredible shift where you just the situation gets so overpowering but it's truly a dark night of the soul and then you transform out into this new this butterfly this you know this new creation yeah, there's, uh, you know, in the, in the religious and the Christian teachings, you know, the Bible, I think the Bible's opening line is let there be light. And I like to tell my clients that the ones that are believers, because a lot of Christians will say, well, are you a Christian? And I'll say, yeah. <laughs> They're not exclusive. That makes you feel better. Yes. Um, but I said, you know, God was showing us or that we can speak into existence what we want let there be light i don't know so i i stay in the light that's when things feel dark i find myself saying let there be light when i open my meditation i light a candle and i say let there be light and if we you know stepping out into nature stepping out into a path with the sunlight um you're in the light, you know, nature is very healing. As Wayne Dyer used to say, nature has intention built into it and we just get to step into that. And that's what got me through that difficult transition. Um, you know, being in nature, hiking is, was, became my church. It was where I solved problems, where I felt connected to spirit let's talk about this a little bit. So I signed, let's say I signed up and I was going on one of your hikes. Um, how does that start? Do you, uh, how do you, do we meet, we meet somewhere and then do you meditate first? Do we just start walking? I mean, how, how? <laughs> we, we gather around and you can see people, you know, shifting back and <laughs> back and forth. And they're like checking their pack and their shoes and, <laughs> I just let them, I let them be nervous. I don't try to calm them down because, you know, the escape is on that trail. And the first 15 or 20 minutes, I, I say, talk amongst yourselves. Um, we have to turn off our phones. You, they can still take pictures, but no, you know, silence the phones. And so the first 15 or 20 minutes, um, they're just talking and pointing at things, getting to know each other. And then, then we start with the guided you know, meditations. And then I, um, 
you know, talk to them individually to find out, you know, why are you on this hike today? And this one guy says, you know, I just need to find some healing. And so we talked a little more about that. And, you know, they, they start, what's so wonderful. They don't know each other and these people start helping each other, you know, but not like in a codependent way, Uh you know, Oh, you need healing. Well, I'm a Reiki master. I'm going to heal you right now. It's not like that. They'll just, they're just listening to each other and encouraging each other. And uh, there was one girl that was really afraid of snakes. And this guy was just talking to her and saying, you know, snakes are, they're good. They're really a part, so important in the environment. And, you know, they're out there off the trail. They're not on the trail. And if they are just wait, throw a stick and they'll pass by and, I wish we would have seen one, but we didn't. But, you know, that was really kind of him to to take the time to explain to her, to help her through her fear. And in the end, she was like leading. It's funny how I start off leading and then I let someone else take, I don't want to be the leader, the trail boss, you know. And then she was like leading us out on, on the way back. And I told everyone too, Hey, if you want to hike on, we, we did, that was seven miles. I said, if you want to keep hiking, just go. Well, this is the turnaround point. We're going to, it was three and a half miles. We're going to go back. Nobody wanted to go on. They all wanted to stay together. And when, when it was over, I'm like, y'all can go now. <laughs> no, they still were just talking. And, and uh, so it was, it was really beautiful. Like to watch the strangers come together like that. Well, you know, I was thinking back about that snake story. Um, so much of what we think in so many things we think that are dangerous or bad, it's just our perspective, right? And we've been hypnotized to believe that the number 13 is unlucky. It used to be a good number before the, I think it was the Gregorian calendar. Um, snakes used to be um spiritual <laughs> well interesting i have noticed a lot of ravens um following me lately <laughs> and i'm like at first i was like what does this mean and actually when you look it up um the raven has a lot of positive attributes yeah um but my initial thing was you know edgar Allan poe <laughs> you you're know, a warlock <laughs> right right why, why are they coming after me and 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 I started realizing, you know, it really is how our mind, how, what, what, what beliefs we've let develop in our head about it. Right. And, and right. if we separate from those beliefs and go, okay, I can choose to think of ravens as scary things that are coming down in my yard, or uh, t- they're actually bringing me intelligence and good news. And, and, you know, how do I, you know, I get to choose. I get to choose how I see those ravens. Yeah, that's wonderful. But being in nature helped you to do that. Oh, being yeah. outside helped you to do that. If you were inside at your desk working on a project and you saw one in your yard, I don't think you would have easily made that connection. You wouldn't have come around to the spiritual connection. Symbols are so important. And, you know, the, the brain works through symbolizing symbols and signals. Um, the subconscious mind, I should say, has a lot of symbolism. And when we see that, we automatically go right to whatever that assigned meaning is. Wow, Valerie, you know, that just reminds me, I don't know if you listened to my last podcast with the lucid dreamer, but um, I, I was talking about symbols. And I think you can't let someone else determine those symbols for you, you know, yes because you have to take the time to think about how you view that symbol. So if I had, anyway, if I had a raven in one of my dreams, it's how I view it. Do I view it as a, t- a, a, barren, a bearing good luck or a threat to my health? That's important. And, and on a subconscious level, it's interesting. So you believe that we kind of, we're symbols, we're creatures of symbolism. Right, so think about coffee. Mm-hmm. What comes to mind? Just thinking about coffee. Morning and, and, and kind of cozy and warm for me. Yeah, so that's the symbolism behind coffee. Some people might think of it and say, oh, that tastes bitter. It's horrible. 
Uh, maybe they remember coffee breath on a parent. Um, and so they may not like coffee as an adult because of those imprints, you know, in childhood of dad's coffee breath. <laughs> um, <laughs> so our whole day, you know, our whole day plays out based on all of those symbols, all those feelings, um, and the meaning that was attached to them before we were 12 years old. It's kind of scary and fascinating at the same time. <laughs> well, I think it's scary um, at first when you learn it, but it's empowering when you like use hypnotism oh, no. and you take charge of it. When you finally say, hey, I don't have to believe these things just because I was told them or had an experience when I was young. I can uh, reframe it. Uh, it reminds me of a client that came in for to stop drinking alcohol. And we went back, we do regressions a lot. That's a part of the practice. And so we regressed back. Um, it was the smell of it that he really used. I love how bourbon smells. It smells so good. I'm like, aha. Okay. You know, I don't say that to them. So we, we um, followed back the smell of that when he first learned to like the smell of bourbon. Um, and it was when he was about three or four years old, sitting in mama's lap. And he remembers her breath and the, the clinking of the ice cubes in the glass, the cocktail, as she's raising it up to take a sip. So that was when he got mama's love. He sat on her lap and she was such in a good mood and she was holding him. And all the while he's just breathing in the smell of bourbon. So wow. he drinks to feel comfort. And, you know, you try to take that away from him through one of these other programs and it's not going to work because you're trying to take mom's love. He's associated that. So we undid that. And helped him to see that, you know, mom's love was maybe, I don't remember, not available at all, but, <laughs> but whatever it was, it was a long time. I don't remember what I did, but we disconnected. That it was separate from that was That was not love. That smell is not the love. You know, Valerie, this, okay, so I'm going to share something with my listeners that a lot of people don't know. Um, I was a, uh, for several years, many years, I was sort of like a hidden smoker. Um, I would smoke. <laughs> I'm seeing Valerie's facial expression. Yes, yes. And um, and I equated it. This is interesting. I, looking back on it, to me, smoking a cigarette was freedom. It was it was independence, and it also signified creativity. Like when I smoked a cigarette, it was when I stepped back and looked at life, and I could be creative. And I would sit down and I would smoke a cigarette and then write or smoke a cigarette and paint. And it was sort of like this ritual. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is I've equated that with something that's really not. Right. Yeah, we assign that symbolism to it. And that's what we, as hypnotherapists, we undo that so that the client can be free of smoking or drinking or eating too much. Because it's not, that is not, you know, smoking does not calm a person down. It revs up the nervous system. But because Oh, and see, I always think of it as, Valerie, I always think of it as a calming down. I, I, I take that cigarette. I'm in control now. Ah, right? No, the chemicals in a cigarette rev up your nervous system. It's not huh. a good thing. <laughs> and so I have to realize that I can have that feeling. I can have that feeling with a painting or with a work of art without Right. So, so maybe just taking the you know, smokers want to inhale, they're inhaling, you know, so maybe just taking those two deep inhales. A lot of times we just want to breathe, you know, because breathing gets us in that same state. Huh? See, I'm taking a deep breath. <laughs> <sighs> three of them. That's the, the magic of three. <laughs> And I always thought that was a design rule. <laughs> oh, I asked that in class. I'm like, why do they have to take three deep breaths? And she said, it's the magic of three. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's a, another don't. belief, right? <laughs> if you believe it, if you believe the magic of three. Yeah, so, I, don't, I don't think she knew. So she was just saying, it's the magic of three. Yeah. 
So I have a, a question about the 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 uh, hike. Okay. Um, you said that you lead uh, meditation. I'm curious. Do do you have them all sit down, or do you actually do it while they walk? The, we're walking. Yeah, I'm active. That's why people call me that um, type A Zen. You know, meditation, seated meditation is difficult. So walking, I, I feel like I'm accomplishing walking. I'm exercising. I'm doing something, accomplishing something, right. and meditating at the same time. So a lot of people, when they they want to hike, they want the activity. And but the first, you know, mile or two, we do stop a lot. Then after that, I just let them go at their own pace because they are there to hike. And each, each hike, I try to have a theme. That one that we did at Ray Roberts in May was Mother's Day, but it, was, it wasn't on Mother's Day, but it was honoring Mother Earth. And then the one we're going to do the last Sunday of June is going to honor Father Son. So I try to bring in nature in that way. And, um, but, you know, they all have different themes. So there's one in September and there's one in October also. So, and in, in, like you said, it's that walking, repetitive, physical movement. It's the, that gets your, quiets that conscious mind yeah. and gets to a deeper level. Yeah. It's hypnotic. Uh, <laughs> it's hypnotic hiking. <laughs> well, I, I, I've enjoyed this interview, but I want to ask you one last thing. Um, if you were to tell the listeners what they could do right now with nature, how would they, how could they do this on their own? So to go outside the backyard, a park, they don't have to drive to a state park to do this, um, or find a tree, take off your shoes and just feel the earth beneath your feet. Feel that the earth. Um, and if you know where north is, face north. And then turn to the right, and that's the east, and then focus on the wind and just notice the wind. And then turning to again to the right, that's the south. Notice the fire, maybe the sun or the moon, um, the light, or, you know, just kind of feel it, focus on a passion. And then turning again to the west is the, uh, the water element. And if there's some water nearby, notice that, or just the fluid nature within. So you've covered this, the directions, you've covered the elements in, you know, two minutes. And then, you know, you're, you're in a pretty good state of mind at that point. You've also covered, uh, I don't know if you realize that, it is the, the way people communicate. Because you said feel with your feet, that's kinesthetic. Oh. And then, right? And then <laughs> see, it's, it's interesting. You're covering, all, you're touching them. How do they communicate? What is their three levels of community? You know? Yeah. Isn't that? I didn't you know? even realize the, the correlation. Yeah, because I was listening to as you said, I was like, touch with your feet. And then you see something and then you hear something. I'm like, oh, how yeah. funny. So I, you're making sure, I think we all communicate in all three channels. Um, I just do think that some of, we resonate stronger with one or the other, you know, whether you're a visual person or a kinesthetic person. Right. And I do think hiking is a wonderful tool for kinesthetic. Well, this has been a great experience. Um, the art so of nature. Yes, yes, I, I really like it. Um, I'm excited to have you on, and um, I'm sure we will connect again soon, right? Yeah, hope so. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, make sure you choose the subscribe button so you'll receive new segments when they're released. Plus, check out my new book, The Spiritual Artist, now available on Amazon.com. In the meantime, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.